hey, it's me, your mailbox. I know that I can often get filled with a bunch of letters that you don't know if they are important or if they're just spam. You don't want to go through them, but sometimes you got to. Well, how about to make this filtering process more enjoyable while you're going through these letters? You can listen to an episode of this podcast. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, this Thursday, June 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we are doing a digital live show. We are doing Wizard on Bachelor in Paradise. It'll be similar to the Bachelor live shows that we've posted on the feed here before, but by following the format of Bachelor in Paradise, the drama is going to get turned up to the next level, and our guest will be my wife, Kelly Schubert, who is a Bachelor Nation expert, so it'll be a very fun time. Tickets are live right now at bit.ly slash potterless610. That's potterless all lowercase and then the number 610, so get tickets at bit.ly slash potterless610, and you don't necessarily have to watch it live if you are in a time zone where 7 p.m. Eastern time doesn't make sense. This ticket will give you access to a video replay, so you can watch it after the fact, or you could watch it live and then watch it after the fact as well, whatever you want. Again, that URL is bit.ly slash potterless610. And speaking of live shows, I am very excited to announce that Pot Tour List, T-O-U-R, is happening. Yes, that's right. We're doing live shows again. I'm so thankful. We were supposed to do live shows all throughout the summer of 2020, and then 2020 happened. But now with the way trends are going and the safety precautions that the venues I will be performing at have, we feel safe enough to do some live shows in the United States in August. Again, this is with an asterisk of if things go wrong, the shows won't happen. But we feel if trends stay the way that they are, we can make some live shows happen, and I'm very excited to bring these to you. If you go to potterlesspodcast.com slash live, you can see information about where we will be going, where you can get tickets. There are links to all of the tickets, and it's got the dates, the times, all that good stuff. But if you live in or near New York, New York, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Columbus, Ohio, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Chicago, Illinois, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or Salt Lake City, Utah, we've got shows coming to you. All those shows, aside from the Salt Lake one, are going to be in August. The Salt Lake one is scheduled for the end of October. Tickets are on sale right now. I'm really trying to keep these shows as safe as possible, and we we will be working with the venues to ensure that that safety is there. All of these venues have safety precautions for COVID right now. They've got stuff on their website about their policies and what they're doing to keep it safe. So we're trying to make this as safe as we can, but I'm very excited that we can actually make this tour happen because the world tried to take pot tour lists away from us and I'm not going to let it happen. The shows are going to be a lot of fun. It'll be the interactive fun things that we've done in the past for live shows. So brackets and reality TV type things and just putting our favorite characters into ridiculous situations. So again, if you want information and you want to get tickets, you can go to Potter potterlesspodcast.com slash live. And finally, it is donation time here at Potterless. Each month, we take a dollar for each member of our team over at patreon.com slash potterless and donate it to a different charity. At the time of recording, we have 660 patrons, meaning that we are giving $660 to PCRF, which is the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. I strive to ensure that the donations that I do here are never politically charged. So no matter how you feel about the situation that is going on between Israel and Palestine right now, I also encourage all of you to read up on the situation, watch videos about it, do as much much learning as you can, but no matter where you stand on the issue, it's just a matter of fact that there are a lot of Palestinian children that are finding themselves in harm's way. They need our help. I looked up a bunch of different charities, and PCRF had the highest ratings for helping children in Palestine in need. So if you want to learn more about what they are doing and the charitable efforts that they bring to these children, you can go to PCRF.net. And finally, I mentioned that Patreon team. I want to give a shout out to the newest members of our Patreon team. So shout out to Lexi Willingham, Amy Rowland, Rachel Chambers, and Jackie McGinnis. A name correction for Olivia Yaya. And shout out to Emma Cooey, who upgraded to the producer level status. Emma joins the ranks of Vicky Christine, Aaron Clow, Marchismo, Juan, Rose Marie, Maria, Lisa, Audra, Eleanor, Nikita, Rachel, Alex, John, Noel, Claire, Rory, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Jennifer, Justin, Jacob, Maya, Polly, Zena, Harlan, Nikki, Kine, Sarah, Marta, Flor, Skyla, Adele, Professor Threat, Ellie, Michael, Kelly, Kerry, Connie, Jen, Nedry, Will, Marike, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, the Meadows family, Ginny, Heather, Kevin, Jarl, Pita, Callahan, Bella, Melanie, Rees, Joseph, Madison, Tonk, Sabrina, Sophia, Farzan, Melanie, Matt, Okamahime, Bony Pony, Kelsey, Rike, Taylor, Megan, Riley, Laurel, Erica, Kendra, Natanya, Yogan, Darcy, Sandra, Craig, Demi, Michelle, Henrika, Casey, Megan, Jack, Stain, Little, Elaria, Gregory, Kawkaw, Ribbon, Jack, Serenity, Haley, Sabrina, Jenny, Eileen, Annette, Hufflepuff, Brett, Mary, Artemis, Samantha, Nina, Tatiana, Karis, Vomit Spiders, Punkfish, Wire Warrior, Joe, Michael, Maya, Jasmine, Neely, Tate, Sam, Sam, Adriana, John, Jody, Dunna, Nash, Emma, Il, Sean, Greg, Matthew, Ping, Vinachek, Nani, Steamed Nuggets, and Cat Eye Potter, who never look at a weather forecast and determine it's not going to be heavy enough rain to warrant an umbrella. I'll just wear a rain jacket and then it downpours. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, monthly live streams, wizard on stickers, wizard on shirts, and more, you can head on over to patreon.com slash potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 179 of Potterless, our third of four episodes covering wizard people, dear reader, guest starring Johnny Frolicstein. Oh, 
Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man who never read the Harry Potter series as a kid. He read them as an adult, but in between then, he watched many, many iterations of a very silly parody YouTube video series called Wizard People, Dear Reader, and we are here to continue that discussion. My name is Mike Schuber. I'm that grown man, and I am joined today by fan favorite, best man at my wedding, biggest goober on earth, Johnny Frolicstein. Johnny, how's it going? That is like an amazing title set for me. I don't know about all that. I feel like a like Khaleesi Mother of Dragons energy <laughs> coming from all that. Well, I mean, I, one is just a fact. You were the best man in the wedding. That's indisputable. And I also would say biggest goober on earth is probably, I don't know that anyone has a uh, has a claim to the throne besides you. Wow. Well, I have my claim to the throne and that's what I'm going to put up against, you know, mother of dragons, breaker of chains or whatever. That's my, that's my claim. Oh biggest yeah. Biggest goober. I totally, I totally know what you're talking about. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to continue the discussion of Wizard People D Reader, but before we do, what is your history with watching it? I know you are a fan of it because this is exactly up our alley of humor, which isn't for everyone, but such is life. What's your experience with this video series? Yeah, so seen the whole thing and loved the whole thing. I was introduced to it as a senior in high school, and I was on a cycling trip with like some other folks my age and a couple of like co-leaders, and one of the leaders showed us all the Quidditch match or the cribbage match video <laughs> during the trip. And that was like one of the big quotable items from that trip was like us just saying things from the cribbage match. Mm -hmm. And he actually showed me a version of the video that doesn't exist anymore because I think somebody like made it based on what Brad, the wizard people, dear reader creator had made. That was like, it had a bunch of animations on the screen and like a score oh. line at the bottom and everything. And it was like a real sporting event and it was hilarious, but it doesn't exist anymore, which I'm really sad about. So that's my, that was my intro and since I've watched the whole thing and it's, it's so good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad that we now have a fully seasoned expert. We had Brandon's newbie perspective. We have your seasoned perspective as we do the final chapters. So we pick up our story at chapter 18, which is one of the ones on YouTube that didn't have a title. I will say if anyone is trying to watch this and you want a bit higher quality, I'll put a link to a Vimeo version that I found, which was much more enjoyable and it's all in one file. So you can check that out in the description of this episode of uh, Potterless. But Chapter 18 opens with the narrator saying, Halloween, yes! Gorgeous floating Jackie O's in the cafeteria <laughs> and every student is feasting. Jackie O's is going forward the only way I'm ever going to describe a pumpkin for the rest of my life. Right. Is this a Jackie O from political fame mention? Is this a new cereal? No, Whatever it's a, it a jack-o'-lantern is what it is. It's oh, yes, right. Yeah. But oh, is it Jackie, okay, Jackie O is somebody, right? Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, it sounds like a like badass woman from history. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. I always <laughs> knew she was a Kennedy, but I didn't know where the O came from. And now we all know. Now we know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Jackie O is very, very fun. So the feast is just all apple themed, which I'm on board with as someone that eats lots of apples. The feast includes apples, candied apples, appled candy, candied whiskey, and apple fritters. So whole bunch of fun apple related things here. And also candied whiskey, which is that just whiskey with more sugar in it? I don't know, but it sounds pretty good. Actually, that sounds lovely. It sounds like one of those Harry Potter desserts where you're like, man, I wish that existed. And then it does exist. Yeah. I think the closest thing to that existing I've had is, I don't, have you ever had those chocolates that are like filled with alcohol? Yeah. Yeah, I've had those where you've got like a chocolate filled with uh, like an orange liqueur inside or, or stuff like that. Me, me and my roommates when I first graduated from Rice had a bunch of those. And that was very fun to consume those and play a bunch of video games in our v the most bachelory patty of places I've ever lived in. It was a ridiculous, ridiculous apartment. Yeah, that was just like... The snacks on hand you had at the bachelor pad was like alcohol filled I mean, chocolates <laughs> i mean yeah it was like that and then my buddy edward he had all of the asian hookups for snacks so we had spicy peanuts and spicy peas and all that good oh, stuff oh yeah we also so had those good. cape cod chips all the time it was a strange apartment we called it the tower because it was like a three-floor condo thing but my bedroom was not a bedroom it was just like the third floor loft thing that was connected to this rooftop-esque balcony situation i didn't have a closet and i didn't have my own 
bathroom. So I bought a ballerina dance rack <laughs> thing for my clothes. And then I just parked my car in the street. And then I would have to time bathroom usage and shower usage around my roommates because there was only a half bathroom, not in a bedroom. So I could like use the toilet and the sink and stuff. But if I ever had to shower, I had to make sure my roommates were not sleeping so that I could use the shower. I'm just thinking that it's a good thing that apartment is in Houston because if it was in New York City, you'd still have been paying like three grand a month for it. Oh, yeah. What was very nice was it was because I was only going to be in Houston for six months for a work thing and they had the place. So they basically just charged me a couple hundred bucks because they were already planning just living the two of them. And it was basically like, oh, for six months, will you just live in the common room and pay us a couple hundred bucks? Sure. And we get to hang out with our friend Mike Schubert for six months. It was a great situation. (laughs) So on the way back to Wizard People, Dear Reader, I want to make one more stop at uh, chocolate with alcohol inside of it, please, which please. is to say, I think that that is way better in theory than in practice. I don't think those are very good. <laughs> yes, they they sound better than they actually are. But going back to Wizard People, Dear Reader, Upfish, who is Neville, tells <laughs> Harry and Ron that Harmony is in the bathroom crying. Harry feels guilty, but, quote, Ronnie, Ronnie the bear He could give a fuck. I wrote that down too. That's all I wrote. It's so fantastic. And this is the first of what happens a few times so phenomenally in this second half is the timing of what the narrator says, specifically with the facial expression made by the character of the muted movie is so perfect because when the narrator says he could give a fuck, Ron has this very disapproving, oh, brother look on, and it's just fantastic. Right. You think to yourself, man, he could give a fuck. (laughs) Yes, very much so. So, of course, you've got Coral yelling about the troll in the dungeon. Dumbledore roars to get them to stop. And Dumbledore says, quote, don't panic. Teachers, grab your spell bags. We will find this fucking troll and we will kill his fucking ass. So right off the heels of cursing Dumbledore in My Immortal, we have cursing Dumbledore in Wizard People, Dear Eater. Oh, yeah, 100%. I wrote down teachers, grab your spell bags as something that I wanted to talk about because I think it's like so emblematic of the way this guy works where it's like, It's like something that someone who knew Harry Potter existed but had never consumed any Harry Potter content in their life would say about, like, Harry Potter. Like, ah, teachers, grab your spell bags. And, like, I don't know. That's the brilliance of this whole thing is, like, he's just, like, he's so close to getting it, but he doesn't get it. And it's, like, amazing. It reminds me of, and I believe I've talked about this on the pod before, but when I did comedy sports, it's a short-form improv show where you have to know a lot of pop culture references because a lot of the games you played, similar to Whose Line Is It Anyway games, you have to be able to do things based on movies and TV shows and all of that. So you get very good at knowing enough of a thing to get by, even though you have no idea what it actually is about. And I feel like that's what his level was. He knew enough about Harry Potter to pretend he knew stuff in a conversation and people wouldn't notice unless it got really intense. And then he wrote an entire script based off of it. And it's just great. It actually sort of feels like he knows a lot about Harry Potter, but he's created this character that's exactly in the spot that you just described, which is amazing. Yes. And it could be the fact that he really knows Harry Potter well, because later on in one of these chapters, he calls something else the Chamber of Secrets, which is very (laughs) funny. (laughs) So Snake leaves, and the narrator says that Snake is leaving out of cowardice, not any sort of action. (laughs) She's afraid, so she's bouncing. Ron and Harry go after Harmony to save her from the troll. Harmony sees the troll, and the narrator describes the troll as huge with pineapple legs and a huge turkey drumstick. (laughs) Which, it's not wrong. It is what that looks like. Also going down to the shape of the troll's legs, kind of resembling pineapples. Oh, it's it's perfect. And I like don't know how you come up with something so perfect. But I love when they're on the way to the bathroom. He's like quoting Harry or something. And I think he says, like, if we're lucky, we can get a sneak peek at Dumbledore's chops. And yep, I have yep. no idea what that means. I would assume they mean chops as in skills, as in maybe if Dumbledore faces the troll, we'll get a little peek at him attacking it what his prowess as a dueling wizard is like that was what i was guessing from that line that makes way more sense because i thought they were talking about it in the context of going into a bathroom like seeing dumbledore like oh seeing dumbledore (laughs) and his dumble 
his dumbles. <laughs> right, yeah, seeing his dumbles in the, in the bathroom is what I thought. No, I do not think it was that. They also call it the girl's crapper, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> when the narrator talks about the troll destroying the bathroom, the narrator says, quote, he swings like a drunken major leaguer, but triumphant music appears and then enter Ron and Harry. Ron and Harry do something that I completely forgot happened in this movie and i don't even know if it happens in the book but they just start throwing remnants of the destroyed bathroom stalls at the troll they just start chucking broken wooden bits at him which i completely forgot was a thing but the narrator perfectly calls this simple throwing of blunt objects spells that even a mountain could hardly weather (laughs) it's so perfect again it's like somebody who like Barely, just barely doesn't get Harry Potter, but he's so close. It's just so great that so many things that are not spells become spells. (laughs) Just Dumbledore standing up is him executing a standing up spell. Right. And just adding more spells into the mix is perfect. It's so funny. The narrator points out that the troll is hell-bent on hurting Harmony for no good reason, which, again, I also didn't realize. Why does the troll want to attack Hermione so badly? Is that ever explained? I think it's just because it finds its way into the bathroom randomly and Hermione is a person in the bathroom. Like, I think the troll wants to attack people and Hermione is one of those in the bathroom. I guess. It's just very strange. I don't remember if when the troll gets sent in by Quirrell, if it was enchanted to attack people or whatever, but it does seem strange that the troll would just really want to hurt a young girl for no good reason. Yeah, very weird. Mm Mm-hmm. So Ron then successfully win Guardian Liviosa's the club onto the troll's head. The narrator says that Ron says, quote, thank God for that hideous pizza that taught me that move. Again, just poking fun at how strange Flitwick looks in the first movie. Just a completely different look of Flitwick. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I didn't get that. I didn't know what he was referencing when I rewatched it for this. You're totally right. He just, like, dunks on Flitwick the whole time. Flitwick in the first movie looks so strange. Just obnoxious hair and weird sideburns and completely bald. And I think the rebrand from movie two onward was so much better for Flitwick. I kind of disagree. I kind of like him as, like, disheveled. Einstein, who's much smaller than Einstein. Yeah, I think it could be hard for me just because I didn't go into the books not having seen what all the characters looked like in the movies. So to me, I just always have the picture in my brain as what they look like from the cast. Whereas when I read other books and you don't know what it looks like from a film adaptation perspective, you have a different thing in mind. I I also take issue with Flitwick becoming choir director in movie three, and maybe I'm conflating those two things. (laughs) What? I mean, yeah, I'm not a huge frog choir guy, especially because it takes up time in movie three, which book three is so great. And any time not spent on the plot makes me upset. But that's another discussion. The narrator frames what they've done to the troll as, quote, their first kill, which is very intense. (laughs) But it just implies so many things like kill counting and that they like want to get more kills. It's so Mm -hmm. perfect. McCormick then enters to scold the boys, but Harmony comes up to bat for them, saying, quote, I was in here crying like an idiot, and these badass new gods came in and (laughs) saved me. If it wasn't for them, I'd be in that troll's stomach for sure. New gods, I think this might be the first time they say it, but they say it a lot more. It's a very fun turn of phrase. It's so funny. You get like such a Rick and Morty riffing vibe from this guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can tell he like has a skeleton of what he wants to talk about, but he just like totally riffs and it makes it way better. I mean, I would think that, except you can hear him turning pages. Part of me thinks he wrote all of this down. That would be bananas. (laughs) It'd be so impressive. That would be even wilder than him just riffing because that means he didn't come up with on the spot. He like thought it through and that was what he decided was the best thing to say. Yeah, I really want to try to get Brad Neely on the pod because I could also imagine him doing this improv and then making a script based off of it. But I would just love to know what the process was because it's incredible 100 percent. 
So Harry and Snake have this back and forth noticing each other and then noticing the noticing and then noticing the noticing of <laughs> the ripped pants and the blood on the leg on Snake. He called it a trade of noticing. I died. <laughs> and then the end of this chapter is a very lengthy disc to audio instructions for <laughs> chapter 19, which I could not tell if it was real or if it was just playing on the fact that this was supposed to be a book on tape scenario and he was making fun of that type of deal. But I also, given that this came out in 2004, I don't know how this was originally done where it was a MP3 file that you downloaded. I could also see this being a thing where, I don't know, LimeWire had a maximum file size and the audio was too much, so it actually was broken up into two parts. Either way, I loved it. The thing is, it was so long and so drawn out that it feels like it has to have been a bit. Like, I had the same question, like, wait, is he kidding or is he being serious? But like, it was so like detailed that it it has to be a bit. I think it has to be a bit, but I also would not be surprised if it also served a functional purpose. Like he did, for the sake of file size, he did have to do this. So he made the most of the moment by just doing an over the top joke about what books on tape would do when you had like cassette tapes of books. Right, right. And Assuming that people would be listening on one of those medium instead of MP3 files or whatever. Yeah, it, it was really good. Right. And it, I mean, especially 2004, YouTube wasn't really, I don't think YouTube existed until 2005. So I, I wonder what people legitimately did to consume this thing, not live in person when he did shows at theaters. I also wonder what people did to, if they wanted to get radicalized online. <laughs> Chapter 19, the cribbage match. So the cribbage match is probably the most iconic video from the subset. Like if you're watching it on YouTube and you're not going to watch the whole thing, you're either watching the beginning or the cribbage match because this was, and we talked about this before recording, it was so hard when taking notes for this to not just write down every quote that is said. And my notes for the cribbage match chapter is just a compilation of quotes because they're all just top notch. People who've never seen Wizard People, Dear Reader, will still quote this. Like this is this is reached cultural ubiquity. Mm -hmm. The final line, certainly, and yeah. we will get there. <laughs> so it starts with Snake at the meal table, which is one of the funniest scenes in the movie that I think you and I or me and Kelly have talked about on the pod with Snape being absurd and eye shifting and all of that his line here is really funny but also funny is what the narrator says that snape says here instead quote nice work on the troll thing i wish you luck today in the cribbage match to harry and then harry responds with the most devastating burn of all time and says i wish you luck not hating your parents for mixing up such an unfortunate person <laughs> jesus <laughs> scalding hot burn scalding hot harry then reveals suspicions to ron and harmony about Snake letting in the troll to get the bag from Dumbledore's vault, which is what the dog is guarding. Shortly afterwards, Harry gets his broom from the owls, but the narrator calls the owl, quote, a post office bird. <laughs> Like, not inaccurate. It's very well done. And then Harry says, Willikers, the broom I wanted way back in Calgon Alley. <laughs> so the broom is not the Nimbus 2000. It is the Necromo Benimbro Salifasagoso. <laughs> Honestly, she should have done a put out her deliminator thing with Nimbus 2000 where it became yep. that in future books. Just so funny, especially because after he finishes this absurd name, the next thing to see on the screen is a zoom in on Nimbus 2000. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. It's so absurd. So Harry immediately realizes that Soft Castle, not Hard Castle, Soft mm -hmm. Castle McCormick, which is, I guess, what McCormick is when she's being nice, mm -hmm. is the person that gave him the broom. Then the narrator continues, quote, Now imagine music, dear readers, heavy with cellos at a rapid staccato. Cellos held between thighs in a little room, the little room of Harry's chest. And this is to introduce when he's getting ready to take the pitch for Quidditch. What an amazing way to say he was nervous. Oh, what, a, what a beautiful way to say that. So fantastic. Cellos in a little room, the little room inside your chest. Oh, incredible. He also goes on to describe the team as, quote, a ragtag group of champions. And with Harry, the new god, they know they will dominate the day. <laughs> So the match happens and you just get some incredible quotes. First, Harry is a world laced with rivers of wizardly blood. He is ready. 
also, quote, he throws his leg over his steed and rips the air a new one. I love that. Rips the air a new one. Mm -hmm. And finally, whoosh and whoosh, the players take their positions. So this was all just preamble before the game even starts. And it's just wonderful. The other thing that I loved right before the game starts is when he goes, when he's like, just blow the fucking whistle. (laughs) (laughs) Which is something that anyone who's ever played field sports has yelled before a game. And I'm picturing like stoppage time of like a really close game of football slash soccer. And the people are waiting for the rep to blow the whistle so the game will end because they're up by one. And they're all just saying like, just blow the fucking whistle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So good. Harry is so hyped for the game to start right before he yells at Hooch to blow the fucking whistle. He's so hyped that (laughs) the narrator says he is restraining himself from eating the fingers off of his opponents. (laughs) The snitch then comes out of the little holder when they release all of the balls. Quote, Harry knows what he has to do, and I'd warn God himself not to get in the way. (laughs) Any quote where they just make Harry the most powerful being is so much fun. Yeah. So fun. Because it totally oscillates between him being that and being, like, totally incompetent. Mm -hmm. This is something I realized just from watching this. They show scenes of Lee Jordan adjusting the scoreboard. And the way the scoreboard works in the movies, there's a little lever he pushes for the 100s column and the 10s column. And then there's also a button for the ones column, but you can only score 10 or 150 points. So why? What is the purpose? It kind of reminds me of spades where you score in, have you played spades? Yes, but there's no bags. We've played spades together. Oh yeah. We play, we got to get this documented because this is the most absurd spades thing that's ever happened. Me and you were playing against Kelly and Anna Grace and we were losing by so many points that the (laughs) only way we could win because they had, I don't know, 480 and we were playing to 500. The only way we could win is if I went blind nil and you did the max number where you won every hand and then we did it. Oh, you're so (laughs) right. It was like, close your eyes, shot in the dark level of like, absurdity right and we just got the perfect hands where you had an incredible hand and i think you bid 12 and i bid blind nil and that was the only way we could win and we pulled it off because you had a perfect hand and i had a perfect hand for going nil it's the most absurd thing that's ever happened to me when playing spades oh i totally forgot about that but you know what i mean right like i know there's no bags in quidditch but like that sort of feels like the only potential use case where it's like If you get 10 fouls, something bad happens and you got to count up to 10. I guess, but I unfortunately have read Quidditch through the ages and there's no mention of that. And I think when you make a penalty shot, it's worth 10. So I don't know, unless they use the scoreboard for other things. Like maybe it's the scoreboard when they play (laughs) gobstones. So Angelina scores a quaffle, which the narrator calls the big ball. But the crowd is apparently frozen in silence. Narrator says, I guess they need blood splattered in their faces to keep them from yawning. The best part about that is they're all still like going wild and totally reacting. And he still just is acting like they're bored and sleepy. And it's bananas. The narrator lives in this strange space where every now and then he describes something that just is not happening. And you got to take him at his word for it. <laughs> and it helps that the movie is muted. One of the ones I was watching on YouTube, it was higher quality, but they had the volume of the movie kind of low and playing, and it completely ruins the experience. Something about it being absolutely silent other than the narrator makes it so pure. It's like the narrator's deal, right? Like you don't care about what's happening in the movie and like learning like the character of the narrator is most of the fun and learning about his oddities and quirks and how bad he is at this job and so you're right like having volume ruins that effect yeah you have to ultimately yes and all of the narrator's choices (laughs) and sometimes that involves ignoring what you just saw or are about to see right so marcus flint is referred to as quote the most hideous boy in the world he has a lumber pile in his mouth that he is calling teeth And that is accurate that in this movie, his teeth are rough and they very much amp that up for the movie. And also the actor who plays him now has incredible teeth. He's incredibly attractive. He's doing well, very well for himself. Yeah, I'm I'm glad about that. I I, never thought about that before, but I'm glad that his teeth are perfectly fine and that it was a movie thing. I love that. After he describes him that way, his name becomes Joey Lumbermouth. Joe Lumbermouth. Yes. (laughs) 
And another thing I didn't realize is that Joe Lumbermouth hits beloved Major Wood with a bludger, but he's not a beater, which I think is against the rules. He takes the beater's club and just hits a bludger at Wood and then gives it back to his beater and flies off. I don't think you're allowed to do that. And even if you are, why does that make sense? The bludger was coming at the beater and you just mm-hmm. took the bat and, and, and that's not strategic. Yeah, it's like, did you see that baseball play, the center fielder on the Rays, I think, who cut off his left fielder to try to make a play home yes, yes. and just completely ruined it? Yes. <laughs> it felt very much like that where he decided, I can do this better than you and the other guy probably should have said, no, this is my one job. Right, right. I do <laughs> one thing in this whole game. Please let me do my job, sir. So Harry ignites with rage when Wood is hit. McCormick works under her muffed ears because she's wearing earmuffs. And (laughs) when Slytherin scores again, you get a cut to Harry where in the movie he just grunts and just goes like, ah, grr, he doesn't even say anything. But the narrator says that he let out a huge fuck. (laughs) And paired with the face that Daniel Radcliffe makes, it 100% looks believable that that is what he said. And it's it just works so well. It's so, yeah, it's another example of the, the narration matching the video perfectly. And again, when Angelina Johnson gets railroaded into the bleachers, similar thing where Harry goes, fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, Harry. Hold on there a sec past Mike. Hey, everyone, it's me, Editing Mike. Before we continue the journey through Wizard People, dear reader, let's take a little bit of a break for Wingardium at Redosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Loot Crate. Let's say hypothetically that you are Harry Potter, and currently the only thing that you've got inside your room underneath the stairs are tiny miniature horses. You want to flesh out your room with some cool nerdy stuff. Where could you get cool nerdy stuff? Loot Crate! Loot Crate is the original fan-powered subscription. They partner with entertainment, gaming, sports, and pop culture to deliver monthly-themed crates. You can get a general Loot Crate, or Loot Crate DX, which has items from a bunch of different fandoms, or you can go fandom-specific. Some of those specific fandoms include Marvel, Fire Firefly, WWE, Crunchyroll, Rick and Morty, Fallout, and so much more. I've gotten some fantastic items from Loot Crate. We got Loot Crate DX, which had some of the nicer items. We got a Jurassic Park backpack. We got a Back to the Future package, which had a Back to the Future mug and a Back to the Future long sleeve shirt that were really cool. And we got a Marvel box that had a bunch of really fun X-Men goodies in it. So if you want to try out Loot Crate and get some sweet, nerdy items, you can go to the link in the description of this episode, or you can also go to multitude.productions slash Loot Crate. And when you're there, if you use the promo code Potterless, you'll get 15% off your first order. So again, click the link in the episode description or go to multitude.productions slash loot crate and use the promo code Potterless for 15% off your first order. So head on over to multitude.productions slash loot crate, use the code Potterless for 15% off and get some nerdy things to decorate your bedroom today. And now you'll hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of these ads will be read by me, others of them won't. The ones that aren't are inserted locally, so if you live internationally, don't be surprised if you hear an ad in your country's native language. And once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of Potterless. Uh, So chapter 20, uh, which is just the cribbage match part two, the game is tied and Harry is, quote, a pensive, hungry falcon. (laughs) The snitch then comes. Harry's broom starts wigging out. The narrator says, quote, is he a bad seeker? The crowd asked. No, I think his broom is cursed. So just a very fun thing that does not happen in the main story, but thankfully happens here, which Everyone in the crowd immediately realizes what is happening, and it's just baffling the things that people can get away with in the audience of a Quidditch match. That's a great point. Why did they all not notice the first, like, in the real story that he was getting bucked off his broom? Like, yeah, call The Seeker out. is doing something, so you should watch The Seeker, but The Seeker's not doing something normal, so you should... Yeah, it was... You're, it, it's perfect. Hooch immediately should have called a timeout, and they probably should have said, all right. Who's messing with his broom? Also, why is there no anti-mess with people's broom charms over the stadium? Yeah, there's there's a lot there that I'm sure you've unpacked in the past <laughs> that we're now relitigating. I loved, there was like a throwaway line where he, he's like, his big break may break him. <laughs> and it sounded like a, like a 90s Disney movie, like, 
tagline on the cover of the movie. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. His big break may break him. I mean, that could be the tagline for Disney Channel original movie, Johnny Tsunami. It absolutely could. (laughs) So Harmony uses an ocular enhancing spell, which is just putting binoculars up to her face (laughs) to see Snake messing with Harry's broom. So Harmony wants to save Harry because he's the only person that is nice to her. So she hits Snake with a hot foot spell and Snake starts knocking over those around him. One of them is Coral, but then the others are Monster Mash and Zuma Croom. I love Monster Mash. Who's Monster Mash? <laughs> like, there's no indication as to who it is. None at all, but I like it a whole lot. Zuma Croom also made me think of Zubumafu, a classic oh. educational program I watched growing up. May Zubumafu rest in peace. Rip, 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 rip. I did learn recently that the Zubumafu monkey was born the day Kurt Cobain died. So as one door closes, another door opens. I didn't believe in reincarnation before, but... But now... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Harry chases after the snitch, an onomatopoeia from the narrator is Ziff, which is very <laughs> fun. The narrator then goes on to say that he feels bad for the Slytherin Seeker since he's been at it for a few minutes, which is accurate. Harry's been trying to figure out his broom for quite some time, and the Seeker still doesn't have it, but continues on. But Harry is a rocketed animal that will stop at nothing. (laughs) Yeah, Harry becomes an animal for the next, like, two minutes of this, and it's Mm -hmm. amazing. Especially when they're diving straight down for the snitch and he's about to crash into certain doom, quote, but Harry loves death. He says, bring it on. (laughs) Harry is like a demon long dead with nothing else to lose. (laughs) Like, what? (sighs) The thing about a lot of this, and this is like, I think another core reason why this is all amazing, is that the words that he's saying fit his voice so perfectly. And like, I don't think this is nearly as funny if he's saying like, other words that are still funny because for some reason like his persona of what he says and the voice like comes together in a way that is greater than the sum of its parts or whatever what i think works so well about it is that the word choice is ridiculous but the voice sounds like someone who thinks that this word choice is perfect <laughs> yeah. so it, it really is like someone just trying to be this obnoxiously over the top fantasy writer but it just sounds like a caricature of what people think that person would sound like so it makes you feel believable that this narrator thinks he is writing the best thing it's similar to my immortal where some of the joke is the way that it's written and also what it's parodying my immortal is making fun of harry potter and fan fiction and punk stuff all at the same time so when it's written in that way the word choice is funny same thing here this is making fun of someone who is just so into high fantasy that they talk like like this, even though no one actually talks like that. So when you say things like he's a rocketed animal, like it sounds accurate. I'm also realizing this thing could 100% work if Nicolas Cage narrated the whole thing. Wow. So you're absolutely right. And also, I think you just wrote a thesis as to like why this is funny and why tropes are funny. And you should publish that in an academic journal because that was really well said. I'll have to get my PhD in parodies of Harry Potter stuff. Clearly my expertise. Your parody HD. (laughs) Nice. So Harry then does his mouth catch. Narrator says, is Harry going to vomit? Of course not. Like a leopard, Harry used his voracious mouth as his catcher. (laughs) Beautiful. Harry then earns 100,000 points for Gryffindor, and the crowd goes absolutely bazonkers. In that video I was talking about earlier where they had a score line on the bottom, it gives them 100,000 points. So good. Fantastic. Harry is a new god who has found his calling, and he holds up the snitch and bellows. Some of the most, if not the most iconic words in all of Wizard People, Dear Reader. I am a beautiful animal. I am a destroyer of worlds. I am Harry fucking Potter. And dear reader, at last, the world was quiet. I'm not a fan of t-shirts that have the word fuck on them. I think they're Same. over the top, but I would wear that on a t-shirt. I would do it. Even without the fuck, just to get I'm a beautiful animal, I am a destroyer of worlds. Amazing. Yep. Let's do it. Let's make one. Ooh, we should get matching shirts where I get I'm a beautiful animal and yours says I'm a destroyer of worlds. And then on the back, it's I'm with the beautiful animal. <laughs> I'm with the destroyer of worlds. And we'll wear them when we go to theme parks together. Yep. Done. So chapter 21 is called Christmas. Yes. (laughs) So Hagar doesn't believe that Snake is guilty. 
but of course, in Hagar fashion, accidentally drops the name of not Nicholas Flamel, but Nicholas Flanel, who does very quickly become Nick Flannel and is referred to as such from then on. How does he make the decision as to like what to get almost right and what to get nowhere close to right? Like that, Hardcastle God, McCormick. That's what's so funny is that sometimes the names are just the names and then other times they are really close and then other times you make filch dazzler and <laughs> yeah. it, it works every time no matter what he chooses it's the correct choice yeah he I, it's it's like intelligent design i have no idea how he could do all this <laughs> hagar upon letting this name slip says fuck you fuckers made me spill the beans. <laughs> die, and then the so kids funny. ask, who's Nick Flannel? What's in the vault? Are we to die in our beds, Hagar? <laughs> Hagar has had enough, so he turns and leaves. But Harry notices that he is the face of a leaving father, a father who leaves forever. I kind of like the whole, like, he doesn't treat them like they're friends with Hagrid. Mm -mm. Like, them and Hagrid have kind of a, like, Test the relationship. Yes, it is contentious. So now we cut to Christmas time, which is described as Christmas time. Snowiness flakes the castle gently. <laughs> Harmony says that she's going home for Christmas because she's got money. Ronnie says that he's going to be staying so that they can find out who Nick Flannel is, and then they'll rule the fucking school. <laughs> it's just so out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very powerful stuff. And Ron continues with some of the most biting Ron lines. He's got some good ones in this whole thing, but he's very intense. He says to Harmony, quote, so run home and open your presents. I hope you'll get a new pillow to cry into. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> you can include this or not include this because he also says, at least I'm not a hideous fucker. I think the Hermione being hideous stuff gets a bit overplayed. Mm -hmm. It feels like when I watched a very Potter musical and they just keep going on and on about how unattractive Hermione is. It felt very cruel there. And I get that in book one slash movie one, Hermione is unlikable for a good chunk of it. And later on, we do get to them liking Hermione in this story, but it did feel like a lot. At the same time, I still really do like that Ron is a upset father on his last straw <laughs> in every quote. And that's very good. I just wish it wasn't so directed towards saying mean things to Hermione partially because of her appearance. That makes it less fun. Yep, yep, I'm with you. And I think it's a function of the time, right? Like, mm -hmm, it's it, mm -hmm. that's dated. Yeah, I think, and that's why it was in a very Potter musical. That's why it's in this. I think calling someone ugly just for a joke was a thing. And I'm thankful that we've largely grown out of that, at least amongst, like, creative humor. Yep, totally. So it's Christmas morning. The narrator says that Ron's R. Weasley sweater was actually knitted out of a dragon's hide by Ronnie the Bear himself. Another example of, like, he's so close to getting it. Like, dragon's hide is a thing in the universe, but, mm -hmm. like, swing and a miss. <laughs> Great. Harry opens the package with the invisibility cloak inside of it. Ron jokingly demands that Harry has to model it and then quote, but lo ho ho readers, it is a cloak, a cloak indeed, a cloak with a cloaking device, an invisibility cloak. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good marketing campaign for that. So many ways to say the exact same thing. Of course, and this is very funny because it does not come up in the books at all. The boys first think of juvenile uses of the cloak, but then a practical plan presents itself. <laughs> yeah. So we get into chapter 22, which is called, and I kid you not, Invisibility Billy On! on! Maybe that was a subconscious thing inside of my brain, but I did learn that Wizard On came from an ending I used to say when I made videos for my old engineering company. I would have to end those videos by saying kite on, so that's why my brain just subconsciously said, oh, when you end a thing, you say a word and then on. That's where it comes from, but... Maybe invisibility on was also deep beneath the surface. Wait, when you say you had to say kite on? I made videos at the engineering company for old disgruntled engineers who were not happy that we switched from Microsoft to the Google suite for work. So I made a series of videos, and that's why I went to France, because it was for the international headquarters. People globally watched these videos where I described, here's how you can do all your Outlook stuff in Gmail. Here's how you can do all your Excel stuff in Google Sheets. Here's how to use video chat with Google, all that kind of stuff. And it was called Kite. That was what they called the work version of the Google suite, at 
least for my engineering company. So the company line was that I was supposed to say kite on. And uh, that's how I ended all those videos. And that's where Wizard On comes from. Wow. And you had to make those videos for a bunch of like snobby old French men who's like, what, grandparents stormed the best deal? Like, <laughs> uh, I guess. I don't know. What was nice was that my boss was very receptive to me making these funny and entertaining which was great and he would play characters we had like a running bit where my boss was frustrated with me and that was just a fun running gag where he did a great job of voice acting and he was never shown on video so it was like a charlie brown parent where it was always <laughs> just off screen talking of my boss being upset with me but also when i would go to events for my company especially if people were visiting the french headquarters from out of town the german people loved me and maybe it's because my last name was schubert but i remember distinctly some people coming up to me at a happy hour thing and a bunch of german people are like you're the guy who teaches us how to use google and i was like <laughs> i am it's me hello <laughs> wow the like G list celeb going on here. Yeah, and the G stands for Google. <laughs> that, oh, wow. I didn't even do that on purpose. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, I think Brad Neely's next project should be a Wizard People Dear Reader, but for those videos. <laughs> Ooh, wow. So, chapter 22, Invisibility On. So, Harry goes into the restricted section. And again, something I didn't realize why isn't the restricted section locked? It just has a little handle that is similar to something you would see on a fence to someone's backyard pool or something. Right. Put another way, it's not actually restricted. Right. Not at all. Harry doesn't even have to do Alohomora. He has to do nothing. You can just get into the restricted section. And even if it wasn't locked off when Madame Pince is there during the day, this is after hours. Madame Pince is not there anymore. Why is the library not locked? Yeah, it's bizarre. The library itself is not locked, but the restricted section isn't even locked? What are we doing? <laughs> Very confusing. So, of course, Harry does the thing where he opens the screaming book. Dazzler comes running through the halls. Harry puts on the invisibility cloak. I love before he opens the screaming book, he describes him looking. He's like, he builds up to it. He's like, he's looking for two words. Nick Flannel. <laughs> and he just says it with, like, the confidence of a man who doesn't know he's saying something incorrect. Like, we've all heard that person before. It's very good. It's very, very good. Dazzler comes running through the halls. Harry puts on the cloak. Dazzler walks by since Harry is as stealthy as, quote, a kitten in mittens. <laughs> you know, the paragon of stealth. Exactly. Narrator continues, Dazzler is a man who has never heard a laugh from a lover, never heard the phrase, you are fine, from a doctor. <laughs> Just another absolutely fire burn. A banger. I completely lost it. I would never want to get into an argument with Brad Neely because <laughs> if you can come up with that kind of stuff, oh, Gosh, just, it would be devastating to argue with this man. Imagine him in, like, a rap battle. Oh, yeah. If he could make this stuff rhyme, he'd be just absolutely unbeatable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the blood-eyed cat sees Harry. Harry scurries away and then sees Snake and Quirrell having a very excited talk up against the wall, very close and breathy in the dark, romantically arguing heatedly. I love that they have turned this into a love passion between the two and not a heated debate. Which honestly, when it's silent, like you can kind of buy it. <laughs> exactly. And I think that that is something that must have factored into the writing is when he was making the script, I think he did it with the movie Muted because a lot of these things, if you don't know what actually happens, you're right. It does fit. That totally could be it if you don't know what they're actually saying. Yeah. So Snake hears Harry breathing too loudly. And this is another great thing where the narrator breaks time and talks directly to Harry saying, breathe into your sleeve for God's sake. I had the same note where it's like he just like stops being a narrator and starts being a cheerleader. It's so mm -hmm, funny. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Snake finishes her conversation and just one quote from it that was so funny is her eyes display Play nothing and everything. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I love it. <laughs> no idea what that means. Dazzler brings the lantern to Snake, saying that there were kids in the adults' books, which is a fun <laughs> way to refer to the restricted section. And the narrator says, Snake is off. And Harry creeps like an icy ghost through the halls. The adult book section sort of sounds like the section of Blockbuster where you're not allowed to go because it has like, mm. you know, X-rated things. Exactly. So chapter 23 is called The Gate of Shit. <laughs> so Harry eventually arrives at the Mirror of the Erised. Narrator says, The mirror is warm and perfect, and the reflection has no warbles. Warbles is a fun word. Yeah, wait, what? 
I, I, I don't know why I didn't catch this. I don't remember that at all. What What does that mean? A warble is a bird, apparently, but uh, it's also a warbling sound or utterance. Through the wall came a faint warble. So this is not accurate, but it's one of those words where you say it and it just sounds right. I didn't know what warble meant, clearly. I just had to Google it. But in my brain, I thought, oh, I guess that's what it called when you have one of those carnival house mirrors that's got bends in the mirror. That's clearly a warble. that's what he was getting at. I think. No, that makes perfect sense. Because it kind of sounds like wobble, so it works. Those mirrors are unpleasant. Fun house mirrors? Yeah, not fun. Nothing about a fun house is fun. No, Everything is bad. You're going to get lost, (laughs) be scared, and look bad in a mirror. You're going to see clowns. Not good. You are either going to look bad in a mirror or you're going to walk into a mirror because you think it is a clear passageway. Not a fun experience. Also, if you're child version of Lupita Nyong'o in Us, ah. you're gonna see someone that you think is a reflection and have them not be one. Oh, gosh, I gotta watch a movie again. It was fantastic. So Harry activates his magic eye to reveal a secret image in the mirror. <laughs> he sees his parents who confirm to him that the mirror is the entrance to heaven. And this is an instance of just deciding that something is just completely different than what it actually is. And it's phenomenal. Yeah, I think this is the point, and it happens more and more going forward, where it just becomes, like, totally untethered from the plot. Yes. But this scene is kind of sweet. Like, his narration is kind of powerful. Yeah, and it's also not wrong. It does feel very much like someone who is watching the movie on mute and doesn't realize what's happening or hasn't read the books, because you know Harry's parents are dead, And then there's this thing where he sees Harry's parents. So it's not the most absurd conclusion to jump to that it's the gateway to heaven. Yeah. It's wrong and laughably so, but it's also not that wrong. (laughs) Yeah. And I don't know. I was kind of like getting chills when I was listening to him Mm -hmm. talk about it. He was so poetic about it. Yeah. It makes me want Brad Neely to write something genuine because I've seen comedic (laughs) stuff from him and it's very funny. But it's almost like when you see Adam Sandler in... Uncut Gems or Will Ferrell in a serious movie or Jim Carrey in a serious movie, when you have someone that is so well known for doing goofy things and then they're also able to just be solid, it's great. And also the reverse. When Tom Cruise is the obnoxious character that he plays in Tropic Thunder, also fantastic. Yes, yes. And you can see glimmers of him being good at serious writing. Like, you have to be good at actual writing to be this good at parody writing. I totally agree. Have you ever seen... Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yes. Jim Carrey, phenomenal. That movie is so good. Powerful stuff. One of my favorite lines from the description of Harry's parents and stuff is accurate, even if he doesn't know it. Quote, his mother is beautiful. The guy seems pretty cool, too. Yeah, wow. Good foreshadowing. Pretty great description of their couple. So Harry feels his trapezius, the muscle, along in time with his mother... This is mine, they say, in scary unison. (laughs) Just totally untethered from reality. What a great way to describe Harry's mom putting her hand on his shoulder lovingly. (laughs) Harry then wakes up Ron, quote, If this indeed is the gate to heaven, then he and his champion, Ronnie the Bear, must enter it together. So they go to the mirror, and when they're in front of it, I had forgotten that this happened, so I didn't even see it coming. Ron just absolutely goes off on the mirror saying it's awful and he hates it and completely denounces it. Quote, heaven is for those too scared of nothingness. I will go no further than my mortal flesh will carry. Which is amazing and speaks to what we're talking about, which is like, that's pretty good writing. It is. And I think that there is an afterlife, but also I've been in Catholic schools and church and all that, like every now and then I get really deep in thought and it's like, what if it isn't real? What if I've wasted all of my time and effort, blah, blah, blah. Like to frame believing in heaven as being too scared of nothingness hit me a little close to home of like, fuck. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I can imagine as a, as someone who has grown up in that world that that would hit you. I just love that Ron, for some reason, is now going to be an atheist in this story. Right, and an adamantly (laughs) vociferous one. (laughs) So 
Bizarre. <laughs> oh, just a choice that I did not see coming. Harry is very upset that Ron is only concerned with the flesh and blood of the now, and Ron leaves, and then they show the scene where Harry's just kind of sitting in front of the mirror, and, you know, some time passes, but the narrator says, quote, for 43 days straight, Harry sits in front of the gate of heaven, waiting for either God to appear or for Ronnie to come back and apologize, but to Harry's surprise, neither show up. It does one of those iMovie transitions where it fades into the next scene and Harry's still sitting at the mirror, Mm -hmm. allows him to say he sat there for 43 days. Exactly. The way that this transition works, it perfectly falls into not knowing if this guy knows what he's talking about or not. But if you're watching the movie on mute and you don't know what really happens, it yep, mm-hmm. you could believe that he's there for a very long period of time. Yep. So Dumbledore eventually enters, then says, Harry, don't you want soup or cocoa, which are the two genders? <laughs> and Dumbledore says they need him on Earth to hack the serpents of hell into twos, threes, and fours. <laughs> What? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Harry accepts the offer, but there's also lots of Native American imagery around it, which I didn't enjoy. It felt very appropriation-y. And I also want to take this time. There was a very thankful email I got from two separate listeners in the past couple of weeks where I have unknowingly been saying stuff that I should have recognized this. And I apologize for saying things like totem pole to talk about ranking things or powwow to talk about meetings i did not realize that those uh, and it makes complete sense like that is definitely not a okay thing to say it is super appropriation need to do especially because totem poles do not actually rank people by importance and powwows are not just little meetings they're actually very important meetings with a lot of culture behind them so i want to apologize for saying that stuff in the past and thank you to those listeners who reached out to very politely let me know hey I know you don't mean any harm by this, but also you probably shouldn't throw these things around. And yeah, I can say other words for both of those phrases and I'll be fine. Wow. Two thumbs up. And I, in the last year, also learned the reasons why I shouldn't be saying things like powwow. And I think that the proper reaction to have to learning such things is not, wow, I'm not allowed to say anything anymore. The proper reaction is, wow, I'm grateful to have learned and I will adjust my behavior accordingly. (laughs) Right. And the other reaction to have is, wow, there are so many other ways to describe the thing that I'm trying to say. I might as well just say one of the other ones that isn't going to rub anyone the wrong way. Even if you don't agree, like I agree with these people, even if you don't agree with someone asking you to change what phrase you're using, it's just so little effort to do so. Can we not all just do it? It's really not a big deal. Start saying quick little meeting. Stop saying powwow. Done. Boom. Meeting. It's the same number of syllables. (laughs) (laughs) Just say meeting. It's so easy. (laughs) Instead of totem pole, say food chain. It's fewer syllables. Boom. And if eagles want to reach out to me via email and say that food chain is actually cultural appropriation (laughs) because it's disrespectful to animals, then I will adjust. But until now, I will be saying ranking of other things and not use totem pole. The uh, E in email stands for eagle. (laughs) Damn it. All right, (laughs) chapter 24. (laughs) Hagar's tale. Harry walks out into the snowy courtyard looking like a man newly married, according to the narrator. I love, by the way, that this chapter is called Hagar's Tale because there's, I think, a chapter in one of the books that's literally called Hagrid's Tale. Mm, I did not remember that, but I hope that's true. That's very fun. So Harry sends his owl into the sky, but it's not with a letter or just to fly around. It is enchanted with a spell, the rarely used Winter Be Gone spell, because (laughs) the next thing that happens is to show the passage of time. It's now spring slash summer to show that it's the end of the year. Yeah, love not so subtle ways to say, hey, a few weeks have passed. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Harmony is back. The narrator says that while she was home, she worked a temp job playing piano in a jewelry store. And now I really need to see this spinoff. I would (laughs) love that. That's like a sick temp job. Yeah. While in the store, she kept hearing Nick Flannel's name. She got a hunch, which she confirmed in an atlas, (laughs) which is a book of maps, that Nick is the inventor of the Sorcerer's Stone. (laughs) Harmony lays down the whole situation, accusing Snake of wanting the stone so that she can live forever with a stockpile of gold and the narrator speaking on behalf of Harry, quote, holy ship, yes, ship. It makes total sense. First of all, him calling it an atlas and not an almanac, which is what he clearly was getting at, Mm -hmm. is beautiful. Second, they talk about what the stone can do. You can turn lead into gold, horses into gold, immortal life, 
give a ghost a body, trolls into gold, etc. <laughs> and I love etc. because etc. implies like, yeah, more things like the ones in this list, but like, what is going on there? Shout out to Latin, which is where etc. comes from, because it literally is et cetera, which is and related things. Where did you learn that? Latin class. I took it in high school. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that you took Latin class in high school. Yeah, not many people know that I did. Wow. <laughs> That's such an interesting fact to learn on episode 900 of Potterless. <laughs> so the squad heads to Hagar's hut, which is called Hagar's Shanty, because they believe that he is hoarding secrets. When they arrive, he slams the door shut in their faces when he notices it's them. But the squad says, hey, what about the Sorcerer's Stone? Does that ring a fucking bell? <laughs> Hagar explains that every teacher, including Snake, is protecting the stone with spells and dogs and flying hatchets and cats and ancient pendulums, etc. <laughs> so funny. It's so funny. But also, this is just the perfect thing where you got to know enough about Harry Potter to know the real plot because Hagar is correct in that a bunch of teachers are doing things to protect the stone. But then he gets it just wrong enough where he says it's every teacher and they're using things like ancient pendulums, whatever that is. <laughs> it's so funny. So Hagar starts acting suspicious. The kids are onto it. So he decides to lay forth the truth because they start to see the dragon egg. So he says that he was hunting in a forest alone a few months ago. He shot a stag and was tracking its blood trail. He got deeper into the forest and was attacked by the ghostly form of Valmart, who demanded the stone. Valmart then hit him with a spell in the stomach that made Hagar pregnant with something, but he didn't know what. Later, on a boating accident in shark-infested waters, Hagar and friends were stranded and treading water as the sharks ate his friends, but Hagar survived because his baby inside of him was screaming so loudly that it scared the sharks away. A fisherman found him later, and Hagrid birthed the dragon egg a week ago. Give me that spinoff. Give My me goodness. that. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, give me just a short story by Brad Neely because my goodness, quality. <laughs> yeah, that's the best fanfic I've ever heard. So then they see Malfoy spying on them and the someone from the squad, quote, after his fucking ass. <laughs> and the squad then begins walking through the halls, planning how to trap and torture Malfoyle when McCormick stops them. She brings them into her office, dons her demerit outfit, <laughs> 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 which is what they refer to losing house cup points as, docks them 50 points each and gives them all detention, even mouth oil. And she ends this conversation by saying, spies and thieves, spies and thieves. <laughs> and that is also how we will be ending this episode of Potterless, covering wizard people, dear reader. Johnny, you will be back to discuss the remainder of it. But thank you so much for joining to talk about it for part three of Potterless. Thanks for having me. I love coming on here. This is a good time. I love having you on. The people love having you on. And for anyone that doesn't love having you on, stop listening to this show. I love Johnny, so he's going to be on the podcast. And if you don't like it, unsubscribe. <laughs> you can't see me, but I just... I just had a single tear. I just had one tear. <laughs> so if people want to find you doing stuff, do you want to plug plug your Twitter account or plug anything else? I know sometimes you go with, uh, you know, more of a harmonious, uplifting message of a plug. I got nothing this time. But yeah, if you want to find me on Twitter, even though I'm not a creative, I am a decidedly normal Twitter user. It's at Johnny for all. Um, that's all I got. If I was to say a message in your place, I would say get vaccinated. Do it. Wow. Oh, you're so right. Go get vaccinated. <laughs> please. I, I'm, I'm sure you have valid reasons to be concerned, but you should please read up and go get vaccinated. Also, it's kind of fun. You get to be sick for a night and eat ice cream. Yep. You get a sticker sometimes. You get Band-Aids all the time. You get free stuff depending on what city you live in in new york city here we get Krispy cream donuts shake shack so many fun opportunities for free food with your vaccination card what is not to love you get one million dollars if you get vaccinated they just oh give yeah you in it. ohio it's a lottery you can win a million dollars yeah which is which is a cool new thing i guess <laughs> mm -hmm. you can get free tickets to yankee games if you get vaccinated at yankee stadium wonderful stuff wow yeah what a deal. So, Johnny, thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thanks for listening. And as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, before they put on their invisibility cloak, <gasps> invisibility, invisibility on! on! <laughs> but also wizard on! What a time. 
Final reminder, we've got a digital live show for Potterless coming on Thursday, June 10th. If you were listening to this before 7 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday, June 10th, you can go and you can watch it if you go to bit.ly slash Potterless610. That's Potterless all lowercase. You can get tickets and watch us do Wizard on Bachelor in Paradise, which is going to be a very silly time. Kelly will be the guest and I'm very excited about it. Bit.ly slash Potterless610. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Christine, Aaron Johnson, Klauser, Lopu, Marchismo, Juan Sanfeliu, Rosemary, Dodge, Marie, Lisa C. Keen, Audra, Eleanor, Kerlin, Nikita Power, Rachel Guthrie, Alex Consulver, John Kotker, Noel Basile, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Jennifer Marklu, Justin Montero, Jacob Parrish, Maya Gray, Polly Burge, Zena Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Nikki Harris, Kine, Sarah Shedder, Marta Morris, and Flora Sake, Skyla Lily, Edel Ryan, Professor Threat, Ellie Hoskovchova, Michael David Yordi, Kelly Otilio, Kerry Crumpler, Connie Binkowski, Jen Went, Nedry O.S., Will Huser, Marai Kariga, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Phelan, the Meadows family, Jenny from the Block, Heather Langeel, Kevin Stewart, Jarls Fiven, Peter McGrath, Callahan and Darius, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Reese Dignan, Joseph Torp, Madison, Don't Call Me an Infidora, Sabrina Balsaker, Sophie Loves Pigs, Farzan Jarabat, Melanie DeGraef, Matt Barger, Okamahime, Boney Pony, Kelsey Gillespie, Rike Mango Jensen, Taylor Payne, Megan Moon, Riley Kiedis, Laurel Happy, Erica Butler, Kendra Hertz, Natanya Page, Yogan Shanley, Darcy Alexandra Harrison, Sandra Rose, Craig McRoberts, Demi Lynn, Michelle Spurgeon, Henrika Wolf, Casey Canales, Megan Stampin, Jack Skitzes, Dane Nemcher, Little One, Laria Vicentin, Gregory Hughes, Caw Caw, Mother Feathers, Ribbon Monstrosity, Jack Parr, Serenity Allen, Haley Hastings, Sabrina Casanova, Jenny Browers, Eileen Gazesh, Annette Pipitone, Hufflepuff alumni, Brett Clausen, Mary Price, Artemis, Samantha McNamara, Nina Campley, Tatiana Schmidt, Carries Davies, Little Vomit Spiders Running Around, Punkfish, Wire Warrior 4976, Joe Sander, Michael Peavy, Maya Saunders, Jasmine Ellis, Neely, Tate Sasson, Sam Sam Reby, Adriana Hernandez, John Savio, Jody, Dunna Morphy, Nash Sanadiki, Emma L. Oscar Thomason, Sean Kirkoba, Greg Bonastali, Matthew J. Moreland, Ping Vanacek, Nani, Emma Kui, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Web design by Kelly Schubert, and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash Potterless, twitter.com slash Potterless pod, instagram.com slash Potterless podcast, and reddit.com slash r slash Potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to Potterlesspodcast.com. Bonus content lives at patreon.com slash Potterless, and merch lives at Potterlesspodcast.com slash merch. If you want to tell someone about the show, you think of someone that might like it, reach out to them directly and say, hey, there's this podcast called Potterless. I think you would like it. Word of mouth really does help the show. Other ways you can do this that are similar are posting about it on social media or leaving a rating and review on Online. These things really help. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on!